First of all, thank you for the invitation to this wonderful city. We have only 20 minutes time, uh, and so I do not want to talk too much about myself. I would like to go straight to the presentation because I would like to share with you in the next minutes our experience we have in my clinic using different kinds of biomaterials. Um, now, of course, we all know and we all are struggling with failures and disappointments. And uh, in many, many cases, these failures and disappointments, of course, hopefully, were made by the referring doctors. But the reason for these failures often is, for example, wrong planning, of course, and on the other hand, of course, the compliance of the patient. And in many, many times, these failures and disappointments are leading to the loss of the implant. But not only this is failure, also this is failure, especially nowadays. Not only the function is important, also the aesthetic point of view. And one of the main reasons in my eyes very often is that we have a failure or a disappointment is that we are using the wrong biomaterials or the wrong operation techniques when we are reconstructing uh, the bone or when we are reconstructing the soft tissue. So, I'm happy that we have some companies, and one of these companies is Botis, that is offering us a big range of different biomaterials that makes us able to react on every kind of anatomical situation that is coming from the patient. We have many biomaterials that will help us to manage the soft tissue, and we have biomaterials to manage the hard tissue. Now, let me first talk a little bit about the soft tissue, about the tools that we are using in my clinic. And one thing that we are using quite a lot is the mucoderm. We were one of the first users uh, when mucoderm was available in Germany. And, um, of course, it, uh, all, there are also still autologous tissue grafts that we are using. But the mucoderm has one very, very big advantage that everyone can imagine, of course. Using the mucoderm, we do not have any kind of donor morbidity. And if you have patients in Munich, they are very sensitive and very sensible. They do not want to have any pain. That gives us the chance to help to reconstruct or to help to manage the soft tissue without any kind of donor morbidity. Um, the mucoderm has a very, some properties that makes the use very easy. Of course, one is that it's very easy to design, to shape. Uh, the other one is that it's, of course, all the time available. It is easily to be rehydrated. And finally, it is completely transferred into uh, gingiva or into soft tissue, into autologous tissue. So we are using mucoderm quite often and quite a lot. And uh, I'd like to show you just some clinical cases or indications where we are using mucoderm. So, of course, one uh, uh, indication is when we try to reconstruct the soft tissue, even without uh, the need of implants. As you can see here, we have the scar tissue, and it is possible to use the mucoderm uh, with a quite a good result, uh, have, uh, getting again keratized gingiva, even before the implantation. On the other hand, we are using mucoderm. We have seen all, uh, these pictures also before uh, uh, when we do socket seals. Uh, then we are using the mucoderm like a patch, uh, putting on the alveolus, and um, with these uh, results, after some time, we are getting quite good results uh, uh, mag managing the soft tissue. But that's not the only indication. Another indication that we have, here's another socket seal, another indication that we have is the immediate implant placement. Well, when we do an immediate implant placement, we are using a special incision technique that is called CBO uh, technique, so we have a flap that is, uh, uh, goes on the palatal side and is prepared to the buccal side. Then we have an interface between the implant and uh, the socket. And of course, we need to do some augmentation, as we uh, can see here. 
Doing this kind of augmentation, for example, I'd like to have a very quick resorption of my augmentation material. In these cases, we are using, for example, allograft, particular allografts. And on this allograft, we are putting a JSON, a small membrane, and on this membrane, we are suturing um, a, a mucoderm. And then, after some time, we are getting a beautiful, uh, nice, keratized gingiva uh, which gives us even the possibility to reconstruct the papilla. This is one big indication for mucoderm, and the other one is, of course, to enlarge or to, uh, to thicken the attached gingiva, as you can see here, uh, where uh, a mucoderm is uh, put and sutured on the defect, and after some time, you get a beautiful result and keratized gingiva around your implant. Also, it is, in my eyes, very important or a very good indication using mucoderm if we reconstruct the bone and we are trying to improve the soft tissue already with the implantation. As you can see here, this is a case where we did a reconstruction of the bone um, with a CAT CAM block, as you can see here, and then with the re-entry, inserting the implants, you can see them here on the left side, then already we are using a mucoderm to create more keratized gingiva, and uh, finally, uh, after a healing period of another three months, uh, we have a nice attached keratized gingiva around our gin implants. Another good possibility to, uh, to improve the soft tissue with a mucoderm, for example, is with the implant exposure. You can put the mucoderm just beside the implants. Um, on the other hand, you can use the mucoderm also between the implants, and uh, this makes it very easy to make uh, or to create some keratized gingiva for the later good prosthetic results. Now, mucoderm is one thing. A mucoderm is a three-dimensional uh, soft tissue matrix that allows the soft tissue or the tissue to grow into our, uh, 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 into our soft tissue. The difference to a membrane is, using a membrane, a membrane uh, should avoid the ingrowth of the tissue. So using uh, the mucoderm is one thing, the membrane that we use is another thing, and here we have one membrane that I really love, and it has now its 10-year anniversary. It's the JSON membrane. The JSON membrane is a porcine uh, um, cardio membrane uh, that is very, very thin. It has a quite a long standing time period, and uh, I love it so much because using this membrane, uh, is, uh, makes, especially in cases where we have big augmentation procedures, where we, are, where we have a volume increase, this membrane is not dwelling. It is not getting even thicker. It stays thin. It attaches itself against the bone. And we are using this membrane nearly in all kinds of cases where we have bigger augmentations, like bone splitting, like uh, CAT CAM blocks, like block grafting, um, it has become a kind of standard. If we have a bigger defect, this membrane has to be fixed with pins. We are using titanium pins. Um, and with uh, the JSON membrane, I just can rec recommend it, we have quite good results. Uh, one very important thing in my eyes is not to rely only on a JSON membrane, on a semi-permeable membrane. It is, in our eyes, very good to combine these membrane augmentation procedures together with platelet-rich fibrin that we have been using for many, many years. And we are using the platelet-rich fibrin membranes as a border to the soft tissue. So first comes, as you can see here, uh, the JSON membrane, which is fixed with titanium pins, and then on this membrane, we are putting a platelet-rich fiber membrane. But using for many years this platelet-rich fibrin, we have one very brand new thing that we are using now, and that is something I really can recommend. I don't know if it's yet already available here in Spain, but that is the new platelet-rich plasma, which comes from a new company which is called RegionLab. There's one very, very big difference using this method. Uh, as you can see here, we have uh, here a separation gel. 
during the centrifugation process. And this, centrifuga uh, this separation gel is, has also some anticoagulants, which is called natrium sulfate. And after the centrifugation, you get a very, very clean platelet-rich plasma, uh, which is not coagulating and which is always reproducible because it's always very clean and in the same consistency. And using this method now, we have the possibility to do three things in one. One is, because it's not anticoagulating, we can uh, uh, put our membranes or mucoderm or whatever, even our bone substitute material, uh, uh, into the solution. And on the other hand, if we want the uh, the platelet-rich plasma to coagulate, we are putting some calcium gluconate uh, uh, into the fluid, and then we can make out of this uh, a wonderful, always in the same consistence looking membrane uh, uh, for, for our soft tissue management. So this is something that I really would like to recommend and that we are really using very often now. Here you can see one case, which is combining everything. Uh, this is a classical augmentation procedure in the lower jaw. First, uh, you have the augmentation material. In this case, it is a particular uh, material. Then it is covered by a JSON membrane, which is attached to the uh, graft material. On this, we are putting a PRP membrane, and then it's sutured. And then we have quite a good um, possibility and stability of our augmentation material for the implant insertion. So this is something uh, we are really doing now in standard, and I would like to recommend this. Now, this is the soft tissue. Of course, we have also to talk about our hard tissue. And there are so many, many, many things, many different kind of materials that we are using. Botus is offering a large range of it, and, but it, this is not only the decision that we have to uh, make, not only what kind of material we are using, we have to also make the decision what kind of membrane we are using, shall, uh, what kind of operation technique, shall we do a bone splitting, a segment osteotomy, a block grafting, a bone ring, or whatever. And um, doing, for example, these classical augmentation procedures, like Xenos lift, for example, we are always using uh, materials that are mixed. Why? Because I like, if for these uh, 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 grafting uh, techniques, I like a volume stability. So that means in these cases, I want on one hand something that is uh, really volume stable, especially in the vertical dimension. And on the other hand, I would like something that has a, 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 a big potential for bone growing. So we are mixing it. And usually we are mix, mixing allografts. That means, uh, for example, we have now here in Spain available from Botus MaxGraft as a particular material together with alloplastic materials, for example, Cerabone. On the other hand, doing uh, augmentation procedures uh, like osteoplastic augmentations, for example, you can see here uh, a classical segment osteotomy. There we have a bone defect which is surrounded everywhere with, uh, with the autologous bone of the patient. And I don't have to be afraid that we have a collapse uh, of the graft um, in a vertical dimension. So in these cases, I like my defect very, very quickly rebuilt. And in these cases, we are using not mixed uh, particular grafts. In these cases, we are using uh, pure auto, uh, allo, allo grafts, like, for example, max graft. The same thing is when we have, for example, bone splitting. This is a classical bone splitting. In this case, I don't want there something that is not resorbable. I want, like a hydroxyl appetite, I want there everything completely as quick as possible resorbable, and there we are using uh, allo grafts. As you can see here, uh, in the last 10 years, many thousand operations, uh, there are uh, uh, the most uh, uh, graphs that we are using are these mixed forms, but for bigger uh, uh, bone defects, you can see here, we are also using allogenic bone blocks. But that's all in all only about 2% of all of our augmentation procedures. Now, 
uh, in former times, about, I would say, about uh, 16 years ago, in Germany, again available, was the possibility to use allogenic bone blocks. Now, allogenic means that we have the same uh, species, so that's a human donor, but not the same individuum. Uh, 16 years ago, it was just possible to get these blocks uh, in a, a certain kind of shape, and then you had to shape the blocks by yourself, and you had to adjust them to the bone defect. And we did this many, uh, in many, many times with quite good results, as you can see here. This is a cone beam CT here. After uh, six months, you can see that there is no, nearly no difference uh, to, the, um, to the local bone. It is completely osteointegrated. And we had quite good results. It was possible to insert uh, very stable implants. And we operated with this operation method, with these uh, allogenic bone blocks, more than 100 patients, quite good and quite successful. But then about six or seven years ago, in this time age we are living in, we are living all in the digital time age uh, where we are very where it is very easy for us to get uh, three-dimensional DICOM data, because, for example, in our office, there are already two comb beam CTs running all the time. Uh, and with the help of companies like Botis, for example, it is now possible to get something very nice and very uh, charming thing, and that is the three-dimensional prefabricated allogenic bone transplant. So a bone transplant that fits into the bone defect of the patient, just like a key in a keyhole. And how does this work? It is like a patient comes to our office, and then he has, I'm looking at the patient, and I can see that he has a very uh, difficult or severe bone defect, and I take the decision, we need a three-dimensional, uh, we need a three-dimensional um, uh, DICOM data. Then we are making the design, uh, we make the simulation, and after four or six weeks, we are getting our uh, three-dimensional pre-shaped bone block. For example, in this case here, this tooth has to be extracted. We make the simulation. Then our bone block is delivered, and uh, the operation is proceeded. This is the case after six months. You can see already that we have a beautiful bone, which is living, which is uh, very hard. We can make an implant insertion, and here, you can see that we are able to make out of a case like this, which is in the aesthetic zone, something that is like this. We did these operations quite a lot, also in the mandible. For example, first we were not very sure if it's possible to do this in the mandible, but you can see here that we are doing it. There is the uh, JSON membrane covered again by a PRF membrane, and this is the result after six months, and uh, the re-entry and uh, we could see that it is completely possible, also in the mandible, to do these kind of uh, CAT CAM blocks. So um, we did more than 100 of these CAT CAM blocks, most or many of them really in the aesthetic zone of the maxilla. We were able to insert already many implants, for heaven's sake, without any kind of uh, complication, without any loss of any implant. And uh, our indications for this uh, uh, bone augmentations are the, uh, the defects in the maxilla, in the aesthetic zone, the severe bone defects in the posterior maxilla, and where other augmentation techniques have failed. And as a take-home message, after this 20 minutes uh, that are already over, I would like to say to you, I think that this new grafting techniques that we have now with our uh, 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 three-dimensional data, which is possible to make, is really a chance to uh, help predictable patients, especially in the aesthetic zone. Uh, and it was a pleasure for me to be here. I hope I'm in time, and I would like to thank you for the uh, invitation. If you want to see more of these CAT CAM blocks, you have to come into the workshop that will be later. I will go there in detail. Thank you very much.